Chapter 21 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 I Go on a Scouting Expedition. Let's see, the last chapter left me with a million dollars, more or less, of Confederate money in my possession, and yet I had not enough to buy a square meal. I think there was no one thing that caused the people of the Confederate States, outside of their army, to realize the hopelessness of their cause, along in 64, as much as the relative value of Confederate money and greenbacks. Of course, the Confederate soldiers, poor fellows, realized the difference some when they could get hold of greenbacks, but the people of the South who did not have rations furnished them and who had to skirmish around and buy something to live upon, early learned that a greenback was worth two in the bush, as it were. No community in the South was more loyal to the Confederacy than the people of Montgomery, Alabama. They tried to use Confederate currency as long as there was any hope, and they tried hard to despise the greenbacks, but when it got so that a market basket full of their own currency was looked upon with suspicion by their own dealers and eatables, and a greenback was sought after by the dealer, and its possessor was greeted with a smile, while the overloaded possessor of Confederate currency was frowned upon, more in sorrow than in anger, however, a wild desire took possession of the people to get hold of the hated greenbacks, and a soldier or army follower who had a good supply of greenbacks was met more than halfway in reconciliation, and little jobs were put up to get the money that made many ashamed. But they had to have greenbacks. Many would have given their lives if Confederate money could have been as good as the money of the invaders, but it was not, and never could be and it was not an hour after the enemy was in Montgomery before people who had been loyal to the South up to that hour and believed in its currency went back on it completely, and they cherished the greenback and hugged it to their bosoms like an old friend. They had rather had gold, but good green paper would buy so much more than any currency they had known for years that they snatched it greedily and many of them enjoyed the first real respect for the Union that they had had for four years, when they met the well-fed and well-clothed Union soldiers, who did not seem as bad as they had been painted, the poorest one of which had more money in his pockets than the richest citizen of supposed wealth. The people seemed surprised to meet well-dressed private soldiers who could converse on any subject, and who seemed capable of doing any kind of business. Fires broke out in many places in the city, and Union soldiers went to work with the primitive fire apparatus at hand and put out the fires. Locomotives had been thrown from the track of the railroad in an attempt to destroy them, and private soldiers were detailed to put the locomotives together and run them, which they did, to the surprise of the people. An officer would take charge of a quantity of captured property and he would detail the first half-dozen soldiers he met to go and make out an invoice of the property, and the boys would do it as well as the oldest southern merchant. A planter that could not speak anything but French would come to the captain of a company to complain of something, and the captain, after vainly trying to understand the man, would turn to some soldier in his company and say, Here, Frenchy, talk to this man and see what he wants and the soldier would address the planter in French, politely, and in a moment the difficulty would be settled, and the planter would go away bowing and smiling. Any language could be spoken by the soldiers, and any business that ever was transacted could be done by them. A soldier printer visited the office of a city paper, and in a conversation with the editor informed him that there were editors enough in his regiment to edit the New York Herald. At first the better class of citizens, the old fathers in Israel of the Confederacy, stood aloof from the new soldiers in blue, expecting them to be insolent, as conquerors are sometimes supposed to be. But soon they saw that the boys were as mild a mannered and friendly and jolly a lot as they ever saw, not the least inclined to gloat over their fallen enemy, and at times acting as though they were sorry to make any trouble. 
and it was not long before boys in blue and citizens in gray were playing billiards together with old gentlemen keeping count for them old fellows who a week before would have been insulted if any one had told them they would ever speak to a yankee soldier the second day the southern ladies who had kept indoors came out and promenaded the beautiful streets and seemed to enjoy the sight of the bright uniforms and before night acquaintances had been made and it did not cause any remark to see union officers and soldiers waiting with ladies talking with animation and laughing pleasantly it almost seemed as though the war was over it was about this time that i stole my first horse i had ridden horses that had been captured from the enemy in fair fights and that had been accumulated in diverse ways by the quartermaster and issued to the men but i never deliberately stole a horse two or three companies of my regiment had gone off on a scout to be gone a couple of days leaving the command at montgomery and one day we were encamped on an old abandoned field taking dinner the horses and mules were grazing near us and there was no indication that any epidemic was about to break out we were about sixty miles from montgomery and were cooking our last meal expecting to make a forced march and be back before morning i had got the midday meal for jim and myself cooked the bacon sweet potatoes coffee and so forth and spread upon a horse blanket on the ground and we were just about to sit down to eat when a mule that had been browsing near us and snooping into our affairs attracted our attention all of a sudden the animal became rigid and stood up as stiff as possible then its muscles relaxed and it became limber and whirled around and brayed backed up towards us and as we rushed away to keep from being kicked the mule fell over in a fit directly on our beautifully cooked dinner rolled over on the bacon and potatoes and coffee and trembled and brayed and died right there i looked at jim and jim looked at me well condemn a mule anyway said jim that animal has been ready to die for two hours and just to show its cussedness it waited until we had our dinner cooked the last morsel we had and then it fell in a fit and expired on our dining table i made some remark not complimentary to the mule as a member of society and we went to the corpse and pulled it around to see if we couldn't save a mouthful or two that could be eaten we could not as everything was crushed into the ground i suggested that we cut a steak out of the mule and broil it but jim said he was not going to be a cannibal if he knew his own heart while we were looking at the remains of our meal my horse the rebel horse that i had rode so many months and loved so which was hitched near lay down began to groan and kick and in two minutes he was dead then jim's horse went through the same performance and died and by that time there was a commotion all around camp horses and mules dying suddenly until within half an hour there were only a dozen animals alive and forty cavalrymen at least were horseless the camp looked like a battlefield nobody knew what was the matter of the animals until an old negro who lived near came out and said you uns ought to know better than to let your horses eat that sneeze weed that is poison kills animals just like rat poison and then he showed us a weed with a square stem that grew there and which was called sneeze weed he said native animals would not touch it but strange animals ate it because it was nice and green well we were in a fix the men were called together and the major told them there was nothing to do but to take their saddles and bridles on their backs and walk to montgomery unless they could steal a horse he advised us to scatter into parties of two or three enough to protect ourselves from possible attack go on crossroads and to plantations forage for something to eat and take the first horse or mule we could find and report to montgomery as soon as possible jim and i of course decided to stand by each other and after the men who had not lost their horses had rode away the forty dismounted men shouldered their saddles and started in different directions seeking some other men's horses i never had realized that a cavalry saddle was so heavy before mine seemed to weigh a ton we struck a cross road and followed it for two or three miles when i called a council of war with jim 
I told him that it was all foolishness to lug those heavy saddles all over the Southern Confederacy. If we succeeded in stealing horses, we could probably steal saddles also, or if not, we could get a sheepskin. I told Jim I would receipt to him for his saddle, and then I would leave them in a fence corner, and if we ever got back to the regiment, I would report the saddle lost in action. Jim said I had a great head, and he consented, and we left our saddles and moved on. Jim said that now we had only a bridle and a pair of spurs, we were more like regularly ordained horse thieves. He said the most successful horse thief he ever knew in Wisconsin never had anything but a halter as his stock in trade. He would go out with a halter, with a rope on the end, pick up a horse, put the rope in the horse's mouth, and ride away, and nobody could catch him. I asked him if he didn't feel humiliated, a loyal soldier, to class himself with horse thieves. He said when he enlisted he made up his mind to do nothing but shoot rebels through the heart or the left lung. It was his idea to be a sharpshooter and aim at the button on the left breast of the enemy, but when he found that lots of the rebels didn't have any buttons on their coats, and that he might shoot all day at a single rebel and not hit him, and that shooting into them in flocks didn't seem to diminish the enemy the least bit, he had made up his mind to turn his hand to anything, and if the rebellion could be put down easier by his stealing horses at thirteen dollars a month, he would do it if ordered. He said we were only putting in time, promenading around, and we should get our salary all the same. And so we wandered on, talking the thing over. When we came to a plantation, we would walk all around it and examine the woods and swamps adjacent, because the people of the South had learned that a horse or a mule was not safe anywhere out of the most impenetrable swamp. It was dark when Jim and I decided to camp for the night, and we went into a deserted cotton gin and prepared for a sleep. It was almost dark, and Jim said he had just seen a chicken near a cabin fly up in a peach tree to roost and he was going to have the chicken as soon as it was dark. I laid down on some refuse cotton, and Jim went out after the chicken. I had fallen asleep when Jim returned, and he had the chicken and a skillet and a couple of canteens of water. I crawled out of my nest and built a fire while Jim dressed the chicken and got the water to boiling, and the chicken was put in. For three hours we boiled the chicken, but each hour made it tougher. I told Jim he might be a success as a horse thief, but when it comes to stealing tender poultry, he was a lamentable failure. But he said it was the only hen on the place, and if I didn't want to eat it, I could retire to my couch, and he would set up with the hen. I was so hungry, and the smell of the boiling hen was so savory, that I remained awake, and at about midnight Jim announced that he had succeeded in prying off a piece of the breast. So we speared the hen out of the water, laid it on the frame of a grindstone in the gin house, and sat down to the festive board. "'Will you have the light or the dark meat?' asked Jim, with a politeness that would have done credit to a dancing master. I told him I preferred the dark meat, so he took hold of one leg and I the other, and we pulled the hen apart. The hen seemed to be copper riveted, for when I got a chunk of it down, and it chinked up a vacant place in the stomach, it did seem as though there was nothing like hen to save life. We ate sparingly that night because we were weak and the hen was strong, and we lay down and slept peacefully and awoke in the morning hungry. When the hen became cold in the morning, it was tough. "'Will you have some of the cold chicken?' said Jim, and I told him I would try a little. It was better than India rubber, and we made a breakfast and started on. It was Sunday. As we came out to the main road, we saw people dressed up, that is, with clean shirts. As ten o'clock approached, we could see colored people and white wending their way to a little church in the pine woods. We kept out of sight and waited. Several parties passed us on horseback, some in carriages, and many on foot. Presently, three soldiers of our scattered party came along carrying saddles, and we called them into the woods where we were. I unfolded to them my scheme, which was to surround that church, hold the worshippers as prisoners inside, while we stole the horses that would be hitched to the fence. Jim kicked on it. 
He said he had rather walk than to interfere with people who were enjoying their religion. He said he was never very pious himself, but his parents were, and he should always hate himself if he helped to raid that church. The other fellows were for going for the horses. Pretty soon four more of our boys came along, and we called them in. They had got on to the church services and had their eyes on the horses. That made nine of us, and as we were armed, we believed we could capture those old men and women and negroes and get the horses. Being a brevet officer, I was placed in command of the party, and a plan was agreed upon. We were to scatter and surround the church and ask the people outside to step inside and then lock the door and place a guard on three sides of the little old church where there were windows, but not to fire a gun unless attacked and not to speak disrespectfully to any person. If there was any argument with anybody, I was to do the talking. We decided to take about fifteen horses, if there were that number there, because we would be sure to find some of our scattered boys dismounted before we got far toward Montgomery, and it was a good idea to take horses when we had a chance. Well, it was a job I did not like, but what was a fellow to do? We were sixty miles from headquarters, on foot, and out of meat. I had never been in a church row before. It seemed as though religious worshippers ought to be exempt from war, with its wide desolation, but business was business. We surrounded the church, walking up quietly from different directions, and as we closed up on the sacred edifice, half a dozen men, white and colored, were standing in front, and two men were talking over a horse trade. The minister was expounding the gospel, talking loud, and all else was still. We invited the outsiders to go in, which they did with some reluctance. The door was fastened on the outside, guards were placed, and the preaching stopped. The minister had been informed that the Yankees had captured the place. There were only two sides of the church with windows, so two guards were sufficient, and the rest of us went to work skinning the harnesses off the horses. A window was raised, and an old man stuck his head out and said, as one of the boys was mounting an old mare belonging to him, I forbid you touching that mare. A carbine was pointed at the window, and the old man drew in his head, and the window was slammed down. We had got sixteen pretty good horses, when a window on the other side opened, and the minister's head was put out, and he said, In the name of the church I command you to desist. He looked so fierce that Jim, who was on guard on that side, and who had objected to the scheme on account of its being a church, cocked his carbine and pointed it at the minister and said, "'God darn you, dry up!' He dried up. The window closed, and except for the heads at the windows and faces looking very mad, all was quit. When we had got the horses strung out and the men were mounted, I looked in a carriage accidentally and saw a basket covered over with a paper. The paper was a religious one published at Savannah, and being a newspaper man I looked at the leading editorial, which was headed, The Lord Will Provide. I never took much stock in regular stereotyped editorials, but when I turned my eye from the editorial to the basket, I realized that an editorial in a religious newspaper was liable to contain much truth, for the basket was filled with as fine a lunch as a man ever saw. It seemed that the people came quite a long distance to church, and brought their dinner, remaining to the afternoon services. Oh, but I was hungry. I looked in several other carriages and found baskets in each. Every man in my party was as hungry as a she-wolf, and I knew they would not leave a mouthful if they once got to going on the lunches, and as it wasn't the policy of my government to take the bread from the mouths of Sunday school children, I decided to divide the lunches. So I appointed Jim and an Irishman to help me, and we opened all the baskets and took half. Jim came to one basket with two loaves of bread and two bottles of wine, and he stopped. He said, Bard, that layout in the big basket with the silver pitcher is for the communion. I'm a bold buccaneer of the Spanish main, but I'll be cussed if I touch that. The Irishman said no power on earth could get him to touch it, and he crossed himself reverently, and we left the communion layout and passed the half we had taken from the baskets around among the boys. 
and they ate as though a special providence had provided them with appetites and means of satisfying them. After enjoying the meal, the boy said we ought to return thanks for the good things the pious people had provided for us, so I went to the door of the church, opened it, and faced the congregation. They were old and young, and some of them looked mad, and I didn't blame them. In a few well-chosen remarks I addressed the minister, telling him I regretted the circumstances, but it was necessary to do what we had done. We had tried to do it as pleasantly as possible, but no doubt it seemed hard to them. I said we had got to go to Montgomery, and that if any of them who had lost their horses would come there within a few days, I had no doubt the proper authorities would return them their horses, but that they must stand the loss of a half of their lunch as we had divided it up as square as we knew how. One young Confederate soldier with an empty sleeve who had come to church with his mother, and who could no doubt realize the situation better than the rest, said, That is all right, Mr. Yankee. I would do the same thing under the circumstances if I was in your country, horseless and hungry. There were some murmurs of dissatisfaction. Some smiled at the situation, and we mounted and rode away. Before we were out of sight, the whole congregation was out of the church, under the pine trees, taking an account of stock, or lost stock, and no doubt saying hard things of the Yankees. We traveled all day and nearly all night, picked up some of our dismounted men, and arrived in Montgomery the next day before noon. In a few days my one-armed Confederate soldier, who was home from the army in Virginia, having been discharged for disability, came to Montgomery with the people who had lost their horses at the church, and I had the satisfaction of seeing many of them either receive their animals back or vouchers from the quartermaster by which they got pay from the government for the animals, and I entertained the one-armed confederate for two days, and we became great friends. Two years ago I met him in Georgia, grown gray, and found him connected with the Georgia Railroad, and we had a great laugh over my capture of the congregation. End of chapter 21. Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Chapter 22 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 The Spotted Horse. It seemed to me that my luck was the worst of any man's in the army, and I was constantly getting into situations that caused my conduct to be talked about. When we raided the church, mentioned last week, for horses, I saw a nice white horse with red spots on him, with a saddle, and being the commander of the squad of horse thieves, it was no more than right for me to take my choice first. So I chose the spotted horse, and thought I had the showiest horse in the army. The animal was a sort of Arabian, and before I had rode him a mile I was in love with him. When I got to Montgomery a man told me that horse used to belong to a circus that closed up there the first year of the war, and was sold to a planter. He said the horse was considered one of the finest ever seen in the South. I felt much elated over my capture, and refused several offers to trade. I thought no horse was too good for me, and for two or three days I did nothing but feed and groom my spotted horse until his coat shone like satin, and he felt so kitteny that I was almost afraid to get on his back. One morning an order was issued for the regiment to turn out in a body to attend the funeral of a major of one of the regiments who had died and I was sent for to carry the brigade colors, a position I had been relieved from after we arrived at Montgomery. The boys all dressed up in their best, and I looked about as slick as any of them, and with my spotted horse I felt as though I would attract about as much attention as any of the officers in the procession. At the proper time I mounted my horse and rode over to brigade headquarters, not without some difficulty, for my horse saw the crowd on the streets, and evidently thought it was circus day, for he pranced and snorted, and walked with one forefoot at a time, pawing as you have seen a horse in a circus, trained to walk that way. As I rode up to brigade headquarters and stopped, 
I must have touched my horse with my foot somewhere, for he got down on his knees, and as I got off the horse laid down right in front of the colonel's tent, just as he would in a circus. Even then I did not realize that the confounded brute was a circus trick horse. He had been taught to lay down, evidently, at a certain signal, and he laid there, looking up at me with his cunning eyes, waiting for me to give the signal for him to get up, but I did not know the combination, and he wouldn't get up for kicking, so I stood there like a fool, waiting to see what he would do next. The colonel commanding the brigade, a nice old man who had helped me out of my difficulty with my other horse, on the march when he got on a tantrum, come out of his tent and said he guessed my horse was sick, and he told an orderly to go to the cook-house and get a little red pepper and let the horse take a snuff of it. In the meantime my horse got up on his forefeet and sat on his haunches, like a dog, just as circus horses always do, reached up his neck and took a nice white silk handkerchief out of the breast of the colonel's coat and held it in his mouth. It was a circus trick and I knew it, but the colonel said, Poor horse, he is sick, and as the orderly come with the red pepper the colonel held it up to the horse's nose. The horse got up, and I mounted, and it must have been about that time that the red pepper began its work, for my horse stood on his forefeet and kicked up, then got on his hind feet and reared up, and snorted, and come down on the colonel's tent, and crushed it to the ground, and broke the colonel's camp cot, got tangled in the guy ropes, and tore everything loose, and jumped out into the street, and began to paw and snort. I suppose there was a thousand people around by that time, soldiers and citizens, and I sat there on that horse and wished I was dead, and I guess the colonel did so, too. Finally it was time to move, and the colonel sent out the brigade colors to me, and the staff started up street toward the funeral. My horse started with them, and seemed proud of the flag, and I guess he would have gone along all right, only a band down the street began to play a waltz. Do you know that spotted horse began to waltz around just as though he was in a circus, and I couldn't keep him straight to save me. The colonel seemed mortified as we were approaching the place where the services were to be held, and it was necessary to appear solemn. Finally we began to get out of hearing of the band, and my horse stopped waltzing, but he kept up a-dancing and snorting from the red pepper until I could have killed him. When the colonel and his staff, including myself and the circus horse, arrived at the place where the funeral was, another band was playing a very solemn sort of a funeral tune, and for a wonder my horse did not act up at all. He seemed to stand and think, as though trying to make out what kind of music it was. He had evidently never heard such music in the circus and did not know what to do. When the body was brought out of the house and the procession started down the street for the grave, a drum major, with a staff in his hand, came along by me, and I have always thought my horse took the drum major for the ringmaster of a circus, for he reared up and walked on his hind feet and pawed the air and made a spectacle of me that made me so ashamed that I wanted to be killed. I had the brigade colors in one hand and had only one hand and two feet to cling on the horse by and I must have looked like a cat climbing the roof of a whitewashed barn. The drum major got scared at my horse walking towards him in that way, and he lost his bearskin cap off and fell over it, and rolled in the sand, and the horse, thinking that was a part of the circus, turned and kicked at the drum major with both his hind feet, until the poor assistant musician got up and climbed over a fence. The horse got quiet then, only he began to nibble his foreleg as though trying to untie a handkerchief that the clown had tied on, as they do in the circus. The colonel rode up to me, and with a good deal of indignation asked me what I meant by causing ourselves to become a spectacle for gods and men on so solemn an occasion. He said he was tempted to have my horse shot, and me placed in the guardhouse. I told him I hoped to die if I could help it, I said the horse seemed to be possessed to do some circus business wherever he went. I confided to the colonel that the horse had been a circus horse before the war, and the music and tinsel and crowd that he saw had turned his head and made him think that he was again with his beloved circus, where he had spent the best years of his life. The colonel said I ought to have known better than to bring a circus horse to a funeral. 
Well, when the drum major got out of sight, the horse acted better, and we went along all right, the solemn music of the march to the grave seeming to take the circus out of him. He didn't do anything out of the way on the march, except to put out his forefeet stiff, and to keep time to the music like a trained circus horse, which attracted a good deal of attention among the citizens on the street, who seemed to know the horse. Just as we got out at the edge of town, he did make one raw break. There was a colored dray man with his dray backed up towards the procession, and when my circus horse saw the dray, before I could prevent him, he whirled around and put his forefeet upon the hind end of the dray, put one foot on the top of a stake on the dray, and stood there for a minute like a horse statue until I jerked him down off of there. Oh, I was so mortified that my teeth fairly ached and the perspiration stood out on me in great beads. A staff officer of the general commanding came along to the colonel, presented his compliments of the general, and asked if he could not do something to prevent that red-headed clown on the spotted horse from doing any more circus acts until after the last sad rites had been performed. The colonel said it should be stopped, and told the staff officer to present his compliments to the general and say that he was humiliated beyond endurance by the performance of the horse, but that the young man riding the horse was not to blame, as he had done all in his power to keep the circus tendencies of the horse down, but he added that he would have the horse shot if there was any more of it. The horse kept quiet until we had got to the cemetery and returned to town. As we got into a wide street, there was an old circus ring, partly grown up with weeds, near where the division quartermaster had a large tent inside a picket fence, filled with quartermaster stores. If I had known anything, I would have kept the horse's head turned away from the circus ring and the tent, but I thought there would be no more trouble. Just as we got opposite the ring, the band, which had heretofore played dead marches, struck up a regular rippity rap rap boom boom circus tune and i felt the horse tremble all over before i could think twice the confounded horse had tried to jump through the bass drum had knocked the drummer down and jumped into the circus ring i saw it on the bit and tried to stop him and dug into his ribs with the spurs but he galloped round the circus ring three or four times and stopped still as though expecting a clown would come up and say what will the little lady have now? Oh, if I could have had one more hand to use, I would have drawn my revolver and put a bullet through the brain of the wretched horse who was making me the laughing stock of the whole army and the citizens. The procession moved on towards camp, the colonel seeming relieved to have me out of sight with my spotted horse, and a crowd of citizens, boys and niggers, collected around the ring, yelling and laughing. I made one desperate effort and reined the horse out of the ring, and just then he caught sight of the quartermaster's tent across the road, and evidently thinking it was the dressing room of the circus, he started for it on a run, jumped the picket fence as though it was a circus hurdle, and rushed in the door of the tent where a dozen clerks were weighing out commissary stores, stopped suddenly, and I went over his head into a barrel of ground coffee. The clerks picked me out of the coffee and laid me on a pile of corn sacks, and then the horse began to lay back his ears and chase the clerks out of the tent, and it was awful the way the animal acted. After I had recovered from the effects of my fall into the coffee barrel, I got up and took the horse by the bridle and led him out of the gate and up the street to headquarters, with a brigade flag in my hand. I finally got to headquarters and left the flag and the colonel told me he never wanted me around brigade headquarters again. He said I was a regular Jonah that brought bad luck. I apologized the best I could, told him I would never bother him again, and led my horse back to my regiment. The chaplain of my regiment, who had not been to the funeral with us, and knew nothing about the circus, met me, and as usual bantered me to trade horses. I felt as though if I could saw that horse off to the chaplain and fix him so he could engage in the circus business, life would yet have some charms for me. So after some bantering we got down to business. The chaplain asked me if I thought it would cause any remark if he should ride a spotted horse, and I told him I did not know why it should if the chaplain behaved himself. He said he didn't know but the boys might think that a spotted horse was too gay for a chaplain. 
I told him I didn't know why a spotted horse couldn't be just as solemn as any horse. He asked me if the horse had any tricks, and if he was sound. I told him I had not had him long, but it seemed to me if the horse had any tricks I should have found it out by this time, and I knew he was sound because I jumped a fence with him not an hour ago, and he took the fence just as though he had jumped fences all his life. I asked ten dollars to boot, and the chaplain said if I would warrant the horse not to have any tricks, he would take him. I told him I couldn't warrant the horse not to have any tricks, but that the colonel commanding the brigade wanted my horse, and he certainly would not want a horse that had tricks. What the colonel wanted was a horse noted for its strict attention to business. Then the chaplain said he would trade, and we changed saddles, and the chaplain led the spotted horse away, and I was revenged for many things the chaplain had done me. When the chaplain led the spotted horse to his tent and all the boys in the regiment saw that I had traded the brute off, and they thought what a picnic they would have the first time the chaplain rode the horse downtown, there was a laugh all through the regiment, but nobody squealed or told the chaplain what a prize package he had secured. I cannot account for it, how I could have coolly traded that dastardly horse off onto the chaplain, but I was young then. Now, after arriving at a ripe old age, I would not play such a trick on a chaplain. The next day there was to be a review, and when the regiment was notified, I got sick and could not go. I felt as though I did not want to be a witness of the chaplain's attempt to exhibit a solemn demeanor on that circus horse. I thought I should probably die right in my tracks if the horse acted with him as he did with me, so I remained in my tent with a wet towel on my head, and saw the regiment ride out to review the chaplain on the spotted horse beside the colonel, not dreaming that it was going to be the most eventful day of his life. End of chapter 22 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 23 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 Tells How the Chaplain Was Paralyzed by the Spotted Circus Horse. In the last chapter, I told of trading my circus horse to the chaplain, and how the chaplain had rode away with the regiment for review and I remained in camp, pretending to be sick. The result of that scheme on my part was not all my fancy painted it. I stood in front of my tent with a wet towel round my head, and saw the regiment return from review, the chaplain's spotted circus horse with no rider being led by a colored man, the horse looking as innocent as any horse I ever saw. Where was the chaplain? Had he been killed? I noticed half the men were laughing, and it seemed to me they wouldn't laugh if the good chaplain was dead. I also noticed that the colonel and his staff wore faces clouded with anger, and that they seemed as though they would like to kill somebody. Before the regiment had got fairly dismounted, a sergeant and three men marched to my tent, and I was arrested, and was informed that I would be tried at once by court-martial for conduct prejudicial to good order and military discipline. I knew the sergeant and tried to joke with him, telling him to go on with his old ark, as there wasn't going to be much of a shower. But he wouldn't have any funny business, and kindly informed me that I had probably got to the end of my rope, and that I would no doubt spend the remainder of my term of enlistment in the military prison. I asked him what the row was about, and he said I would find out soon enough. One soldier got on each side of me, and one behind, with sabers drawn, to stick me with if I attempted to get away, and we started for the colonel's tent. On the way there the chaplain came towards us, covered with red clay, and begged the sergeant to allow him to kill me right there. He was the maddest, truly good man I ever saw. He fairly foamed at the mouth and said, Oh, sergeant, turn him loose and let me chew him up. I said to the sergeant, Now look a here, don't you let that savage get at me, or he will get hurt. 
I don't want to have any trouble with the church, but if any regularly ordained ministerial cannibal of a sky pilot attempts to chew me, he will find a good deal more gristle than tenderloin, and I will italicize his nose so he will look so cross-eyed that he can't draw his pay. My thus showing that I was not afraid of a non-combatant seemed to have the desired effect, for he spit on his hands, jumped up, and cracked his heels together, and said he would wipe the Southern Confederacy with my remains, and he went to his tent to change his clothes and get ready for the court-martial. The guard took me to the colonel's tent, and I walked right in where the colonel and major and several others were, and I said, hello, and smiled, and extended my hand to the colonel. None of them helloed, and none of them returned my smile, and the colonel did not shake hands with me. He said, however, that I had brought disgrace on the regiment, and broken the heart of a noble man, the chaplain. I told him I didn't think the chaplain's heart was very badly broke, as he had just offered to whip me in several languages, and threatened to eat me. The colonel had me sit down on a trunk and keep still, while the court-martial convened. It was not many minutes before the officers had arrived and organized. The adjutant read the charges and specifications against me. Not to go into the military form of charges and specifications, the substance of them was that I had with malice aforethought procured a trick horse from a circus with the intention of inducing the chaplain to trade for it, with the purpose of causing the aforesaid chaplain to become a spectacle for laughter. When the charges were read, I was asked what I had to say, and I told the judge advocate it was a condemned lie. That made him mad, and he was going to commence whipping me where the chaplain left off, when the colonel smoothed matters over by asking me if I didn't mean to plead not guilty. I said, certainly not guilty. It is false. I did not secure the horse for the purpose of sawing it off on the chaplain. I jayhawked it and when I found it was not the kind of horse for a modest fellow like me, who didn't want to make any display, I thought I would trade it to some officer with gall, and the chaplain was the first man who struck me for a trade, and he got it. And from his remarks to me and from these court-martial proceedings, I was satisfied the chaplain did not like the horse. The officers laughed then, and I suppose they were thinking of something that happened to the chaplain on review. The colonel asked me if I wanted anybody to defend me, and I told him I had a printing office once next door to a lawyer's office, and I knew a little about law and would defend myself. The chaplain came soon and began to tell his story, but I insisted that he be sworn, and then he proceeded to tell his tale. He said that he was a God-fearing man and meant to do right, and was willing to take his chances in the lottery of war, but when a man got him to ride a circus trick horse and bring upon his sacred calling the ribald laughter of the wicked, he felt that civilization was a failure. He said he traded for the spotted horse in good faith, and that he was particular to ask me if the horse had any tricks, and I said he had none, and he traded on that understanding. That he rode the aforesaid horse to the review, and as soon as the aforesaid horse heard the band play, he waltzed out into the middle of the street, whirled around more than fifty times, waltzed into an infantry regiment, breaking the ranks of the soldiers, just as the reviewing officer come along, causing the reviewing officer to say, Get out of the ranks, you damn fool, and take that horse back to the circus, thus causing him, the chaplain, to be scandalized. He said he would have stood that, but the horse carried him to a battery of artillery, which was in position, and began to jump over the guns, and that a gunner took a swab with which he had been cleaning a gun, and punched him, the chaplain, in the face, covering his face with burnt powder, which smelled badly. Then the horse carried him out on the field in front of the reviewing officers, got up on its hind feet, and walked for half a block making the chaplain appear as though climbing up the horse's neck, and when some of the general's staff came out to arrest him, the horse whirled around and kicked in every direction at once, and broke the saber of one of the staff officers. That the horse seemed to be possessed of the devil, that he finally got the horse to go back to the regiment where he belonged, but on the way he had to pass brigade headquarters, 
when the horse stopped in front of the commanding officer and sat down like a dog on his hind parts and tried to shake hands with the colonel commanding who was offended and told the chaplain he was an ass and to go away with his museum or he would have the chaplain put in the guardhouse that a colored man near the review ground had a gingerbread stand with a sheet tacked up to keep the sun off and the spotted horse attempted to jump through the sheet evidently thinking it was a paper hoop in a circus and in conclusion after making the chaplain so mortified and ashamed that he wished he might die the horse laid down in the road and rolled over the aforesaid chaplain leaving him in the road covered with dirt while the horse ran across the street and walked up a pair of stairs outside a store went into the rooms occupied by some milliners and scared the women so they put their heads out the windows and yelled fire and said a regiment of yankee cavalry had raided their homes that the review was made a farce the chaplain a laughing stock and that it took ten men to get the horse downstairs and half the regiment to console the milliners and convince them that no harm was intended he said he demanded that i be sentenced to be shot the colonel asked me if i had anything to say and i asked permission to cross-examine the witness permission being granted i asked the chaplain what his business was he said he was a minister i asked him if he didn't consider trading horses one of the noblest professions extant he said he didn't know about that then i asked him if he didn't take advantage of me when i came to the regiment as a raw recruit and trade me a kicking mule that made my life a burden he said he remembered that he traded me a mule i asked him if he didn't know the mule was balky vicious and spavined that it would kick its best friend bite anybody that it was so ugly that he had to put the saddle on with a long pole that he warranted the mule sound when he knew it had all the diseases that were going he said he objected to being asked such questions but the judge advocate said i had a right to bring out any previous transactions in the horse trade line as it would have some effect in this case then i asked him if he didn't know the horse he beat me out of was sound a splendid rider and that the mule was the worst one in the army he admitted that he knew the animal was not a desirable animal but he thought a recruit could get along with a kicking mule better than a chaplain i had saved my best shot for the last and i said knowing the mule was unsound a vicious animal and that my horse was sound and desirable and worth more than a dozen such mules did you consider that you was pursuing your calling as a minister when you gained my confidence and not only sawed the mule off on to me bereaved me of a fine horse but took twenty dollars of my hard-earned bounty money as boot in the trade in doing that to an innocent and fresh recruit who had confidence in you did you not pave the way for me to get even with you on a horse trade and haven't i got even and do you blame me for doing it the chaplain was perspiring while i was asking the questions and all the officers were looking at him as though he had caught a tartar but he blushed choked and finally answered that perhaps he did wrong in trading me that mule and he asked to be forgiven then i turned to the officers and said gentlemen i admit that i traded the spotted circus horse to the chaplain i did it on purpose to show him that there is a god in israel when i came to the regiment right fresh from the people i needed salting the boys all salted me whenever they got a chance and i took it like a little man in turning to the chaplain for comfort i did not expect that he would salt me worse than all of the boys combined but when i found that he had gone through me and taken advantage of my guileless innocence and laughed at my woe when i found the confounded mule was not all his fancy had painted it and that it laid awake nights to devise ways to kick my head off i took a blooded oath that before the cruel war was over i would salt that chaplain on a horse trade unless he would own up the corn i leave it to you gentlemen if i have done it or not when that spotted horse fell to me by the fortunes of war i was not long in learning that it was the relic of a circus i rode the horse one day last week at a funeral and it acted in such a manner as to almost wake up the late lamented i was made the laughing-stock of the brigade and of the town 
it was government property and i could not kill the horse and i thought the time had arrived for me to get even with my old friend he was mashed on my spotted horse and bantered me for a trade finally we traded and i got ten dollars to boot the result has been all that i could desire i have had the satisfaction of demonstrating to this truly good man that all is not gold that glitters i have shown him that however spotted a man may be if he rides a spotted circus horse he will get there i will leave it to the chaplain now if i was not justified in trading him that horse after what he had done to me and will ask him if he was not served perfectly right and if in trading me that mule he did not do to others as he would have others do to him and if so if he does not think the others did it to him in great shape i am done i leave my life in your hands when i quit they were all laughing except the chaplain and there was a quiet smile around his mouth as he thought of his experience on the spotted horse the colonel asked the chaplain if he had anything to say and he said he had just been thinking that he could go over to a new jersey regiment and trade that spotted horse to the chaplain of that regiment and if he could he would be willing to drop the case he said that chaplain played a mean trick on him once and he wanted to get even the court-martial acquitted me and while we were all taking a drink with the colonel the chaplain went out and pretty soon we saw his servant leading the spotted horse over towards the camp of the new jersey regiment and later the chaplain sauntered off in that direction on foot as though there was some weighty subject on his mind the weighty subject was the spotted circus horse i do not suppose any incident ever caused so much talk as did the chaplain's circus the boys were talking and laughing about it in every company all that afternoon and when it was found that i had not been punished for trading the horse to him the boys were wild they wanted to show their appreciation of the fun i had given them so a lot of them got together to give me a sort of reception they sent for me to come over to company d and when i got over there they grabbed me and carried me off on their shoulders i felt proud to see them so joyous and friendly until they put me in a blanket and tossed me up into the trees and caught me in the blanket as i came down of all the sensations i ever experienced that of being tossed up in a blanket was the worst i tried to laugh at first but it became serious as i went into the air twenty feet let loose of the air and came down expecting to be crushed maimed killed my breath forsook me i was dizzy but i struck the blanket easy and after being sent up a dozen times they let me go and my reception was over end of chapter twenty three recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina chapter twenty four of how private george w peck put down the rebellion by george wilbur peck this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24 Mingled Reminiscences Long before this I should have related a little experience I had on my first journey south when I was a fresh recruit. After leaving Wisconsin in the winter, a lot of us recruits were corralled at Benton Barracks, St. Louis, and for six weeks we had a picnic there were about fifty of us that belonged to the cavalry our regiments being down the mississippi river and the commanding officer of the barracks seemed to be waiting for a chance to send us to our regiments i have often wondered what he waited six weeks for when we were not doing any duty in camp and were making him trouble enough every day and every night to turn his hair gray he was a colonel bonneville if i remember right a regular army officer of french extraction anyway he always swore at us in french the camp was run in a slack sort of a way and it was easy for us to get out and go downtown or wander off into the country and as we had plenty of money and were dressed better than soldiers in active service we were welcome to all the saloons and painted old st louis all the colors of the rainbow returned to the barracks at unseasonable hours crawled through the fence and went to our quarters howling waking up the old general who invariably ordered the provost guard to arrest us 
which the provost guard invariably didn't do, for some reason or other. The old colonel was fast aging in trying to lead a quiet life in the vicinity of those damn cavalry recruits, and he said he would order them all shot if they didn't behave. Benton Barracks was the greatest place for the breeding of rats that I ever saw. In every house there were millions of them, and at night they were out in full force. One night our crowd of recruits, about forty in number, had been down to St. Louis on a painting expedition, and it was midnight when the camp was reached. Every recruit had a revolver, and it was decided that if the rats insulted us, as they had often done before, we would shoot them. It was a beautiful moonlight night, as still as death, and we could almost hear the snoring of the excitable colonel in his house across the parade ground. As we came near our barrack, a few thousand rats crossed our path, and I drew my revolver and fired at a large one that seemed unusually impudent and the rest of the crowd opened fire, and there was a battle in no time. A bugler got out and blowed some call that I did not know. A drum sounded a continuous roll. Men rushed out and formed in line, and before we had fired the six charges from our revolvers, the invalid corps came hobbling across the parade ground, the colonel behind them, with his shirt on, his pants in his hands, and swearing in French, and ordering the troops to arrest the whole crowd of recruits. We went right in the barrack and retired as soon as the troops showed up, and were snoring with smoking revolvers under our pillows when the guard entered. The colonel came in with the guard, and then put on his pants, after which he woke up some of us and asked what was the cause of the firing. Every recruit swore that he had not fired a shot, but that he had heard some firing over the fence on the outside at a roadhouse and saloon where bad men from St. Louis congregated and drank to excess. It seemed very hard to thus lie to so estimable a gentleman as the colonel, but as he was only half-dressed and sleepy and excited, it didn't seem as though the lies ought to count. But they did. The colonel apologized for waking us up when we were enjoying our much-needed rest, and he went away with the guard. Then we all got up and danced can-can in our army underclothes, passed a series of resolutions endorsing the colonel as one of the ablest officers in the army, recommended that he be promoted to a brigadier general at the first opportunity, gave three cheers and a tiger for the Union, and went to bed. That is one thing that we recruits always come out strong in, i.e., three cheers for the Union. We had enlisted to save the Union, and as there was no fighting that we could do during our stay at St. Louis, whenever we got a chance we gave three cheers for the Union. Sometimes it was not appreciated, however. I remember one evening our crowd went into a saloon and ordered beer all around, and after we had drank it I proposed three cheers for the Union, which we gave in a hearty manner, and went out without paying for the beer. You would hardly credit it, but the saloon keeper, an Irishman named Oppenheimer, became offended and wanted us to pay cash for the beer. The boys wanted me to reason with him, and I began by asking him if he was a loyal man, and he said he was. Then I asked him if he didn't believe in supporting the Union. He said he did, but he couldn't pay the brewer for his beer by giving three cheers for the Union. He had to put up the cash. I confess that his remarks made quite an impression on me, as I had not thought of it in that light before. I proposed that we give three cheers for Oppenheimer, which was done, and I thought that would settle it, but he insisted on having cash. I told the boys, and they said he was a rebel. I told Oppenheimer, and he got out a wooden bung starter and said he would clean out the whole party. Finally, we compromised in this way. We had given two rounds of cheer, one for the Union and one for Oppenheimer, which were a total loss. So it was agreed that if Oppenheimer would give three cheers for the Union and three for us, we would pay him for the beer, if he would agree to set him up for us at his own expense. He agreed, and we tried to get him to onset the beer he was going to give us for the beer we had drank, and not pay him for that we had consumed. That, to any business man, we thought, would seem fair. But he wouldn't have it. So after he had returned our cheers to us, we paid him, and then he treated. I mention this to show the hardships of a soldier's life and the difficulties of inculcating business methods into the minds of the saloon-keepers. 
Oppenheimer meant well, but he did not appreciate cheers for the union. He got so, after that, when we came in his saloon in a gang, he would say, Boys, if you don't give any cheers von dat union, I set em up. And we would swallow our cheers for the union and his beer. The next day after the Battle of the Rats, an order was issued for the recruits to board the steamer City of Memphis and go down the river to join our several regiments in the vicinity of New Orleans. In a few hours we had drawn rations for a week and were on board the steamer and had started down the stream. I think every soldier that is now alive will remember that when he took his first trip on a transport as a recruit during the war, he labored under the impression that he owned the boat or at least a controlling interest in it. That was a very natural feeling. The opinions of the steamboat officials, it will be remembered, were different. I had never been on a large steamboat before, and after tying my knapsack and other baggage to a woodpile on the lower deck, after I had vainly attempted to induce the proper official to give me checks for my baggage, I began to climb upstairs and soon found myself on top of the Texas, beside the smokestack, viewing the ever-changing scenery of the grand old Mississippi. I was drinking in the scenery and the fresh air, and wondering if it could be possible that there could be war and killing anywhere in this broad land, when all was so peaceful and beautiful on the river, when I felt something strike me on the pantaloons most powerfully, and I looked around and a gentleman was just removing a large-sized boot from my person. I was about to reprove him for kicking me, a total stranger, who had not even presented letters of introduction to me, when he said in a voice that was deep down in his chest, Get down below. I did not feel like arguing with a man of so violent a nature, and I went down the narrow stairs after he had said he would throw me overboard if I did not hurry. I learned afterwards that he was the mate of the steamboat. I could see that he had mistaken me for a common soldier, which I would not admit was the case. But I went downstairs, probably looking hurt. I was hurt. I went into the cabin and sat down on one of the sofas to think, when a colored person told me to get off the sofa. As he seemed to know what he was talking about, I got off. I saw a bar where officers of the army and passengers were drinking, and I went up and asked for a whiskey sour thinking that would relieve the pain and cause my injured feelings to improve. The bartender told me to go out on deck, and I could get plain whiskey through a window where the negro deckhands got their drinks, but I could not drink with gentlemen. That was the first day that I realized that in becoming a soldier I had descended to a level with negro deckhands and roustabouts, and could not be allowed to associate with gentlemen. Soon the gong rung for supper, and I went into the cabin and sat down to the table for a square meal, the other seats being filled with army officers and passengers. I was going to give my order to a waiter when he called an officer of the boat, who told me to get up from the table and go below, as the cabin was intended for gentlemen and not soldiers. My idea was to kick against being turned out, but I thought of the mate's boot, and I went out went down on to the lower deck with the recruits, and ate some bread and meat. I was rapidly becoming crushed. I talked my experience over with the boys, and they all agreed with me that the way we were treated was an outrage on American soldiers, which we would not stand. We began to wonder where we were going to sleep, when I remembered seeing staterooms on the deck above, with berths, and it seemed to me they must be intended for us, so we agreed to go up and go into the staterooms from the doors that opened out on deck, believing that those who got in first would be allowed to occupy them. About fifty of us got into staterooms while the officers and passengers were playing poker in the cabin. I was asleep when I heard a noise out on deck, and raising up in my berth I looked over the transom and saw about twenty of the recruits being driven along by officers of the boat, kicks and cuffs and loud talking being the order. I'll teach you brutes to steal the beds of passengers on this boat, you dirty whelps, to presume to sleep in beds? Get downstairs and sleep on the woodpile with the niggers, shouted the captain. If there was going to be any fuss about it, I didn't want to stay in the stateroom. I didn't want to be broke of my rest, of course, but if it was not customary for common soldiers to indulge in such luxuries, I would go out. Just then there was a knock at the door leading into the cabin, and I heard a female voice say, 
pota i am afraid one of those dirty soldiers has got into my stateroom and then i heard the mate's voice say wait till i get at him of course under those circumstances i could not remain no gentleman would occupy a lady's berth and cause her to sit up all night to be sure there were two berths and i could remain in the upper one and she could turn in below and i would turn my face to the wall and not look but i doubted if a lady who was a perfect stranger and whose opinion of soldiers was so pronounced could compromise on such a basis so when the mate knocked at the door i took my pants and shoes and went out the door leading on deck and went below without being discovered i found my companions who had been routed out of their beds dressing themselves as best they could by the light from the furnace where the stokers would put in wood and they were about as mad as i was the treatment we had received was not what we had a right to expect when we enlisted we decided to sit up all night and growl and discuss the situation several of the recruits made remarks that were very scathing and the officials of the boat were held up to scorn and charged with inhumanity we sat there till daylight and then organized an indignation meeting and appointed a committee to draft resolutions indicative of the sense of the meeting i had been lightning on resolutions before i enlisted having attended several county conventions and i was appointed to draft the resolutions as near as i can remember the following were the words whereas the undersigned members of the army of the union in the course of our duty as soldiers have been ordered to proceed to our several regiments down the mississippi river on board of the city of memphis and whereas we have been treated by the officers of the aforesaid boat more like animals than human beings in being deprived of luxuries to which we have been accustomed have been driven from the public dining table driven from our beds at the dead hour of night that soldier strapped officers might be made comfortable and kicked down stairs therefore be it resolved that we demand of the captain of the steamer city of memphis that we be allowed the same privileges on this boat that others enjoy we hold these truths to be self-evident that one man is just as good as another no matter what his rank we demand that we be allowed to eat at the table in the cabin to sleep in the staterooms to drink at the bar if we so elect and to go to any place on the boat that other passengers are allowed and that we be treated like white men which we have not up to the adoption of these resolutions resolved that a copy of these resolutions be presented to the captain of the boat that a copy be sent to the secretary of war and that the resolutions be published in the newspapers when i read the resolutions to the boys they were passed unanimously after a few amendments had been voted down one of the boys wanted a resolution passed demanding that the mate be discharged and one move the captain be requested to apologize i argued that if the captain received the resolutions in the proper spirit and acceded to our demand that would be an apology in itself and in that case the mate would probably resign i was appointed one of a committee of three to wait on the captain and read the resolutions to him after the boys had all signed them i had rather someone else had been appointed as i had been kicked once already but the boys said it needed somebody that was equal to making a little speech as it would be necessary to say something before reading the resolutions they also said it needed a man with plenty of gall one that was not afraid to stand up before the world and ask for our rights i felt flattered at being selected but i took the precaution to place a gunny sack nicely folded up in the seat of my pants because i didn't know what might happen after breakfast i took the committee and the resolutions and went up into the cabin and told a colored man that he might tell the captain that a committee wished an audience with him he was playing poker in the ladies cabin and i have always thought he had an idea there was a committee of passengers who wanted to present him with a gold-headed cane a thing that was often done on the boats anyway he came along smiling and when the nigger pointed me out and the captain noticed that i had a large paper in my hand he said what is it gentlemen this was the first time i had been alluded to in that manner since i enlisted i asked him to be seated and he sat down on a lounge and i proceeded i forgot to make any speech but went right at the whereases at once i say the captain smiled when he came up of course reading the resolutions as i was i could not see his face change 
but afterwards one of the committee told me about it. I could not tell that a storm was coming. I noticed that quite a number of people had collected around the captain, from curiosity, I supposed. I had just got to the last resolution, where it spoke of sending a copy to the Secretary of War, when there was a howl. The captain got up and grabbed me by the throat, while somebody else took me by the hind legs. As we went towards the door, I noticed other men were carrying the rest of the committee. My idea was that they would throw us overboard, and as I could not swim, I closed my eyes and said, Now I lay me. The stairs leading to the lower deck were covered with brass. I remember that distinctly, because I rode down the stairs on the small of my back, and we had a committee meeting at the foot of the stairs. I brought up on top of the rest of the committee. We sat there a moment, and decided unanimously that we had been unceremoniously chucked downstairs, resolutions and all, and we picked ourselves up and limped back to where our companions were, and so reported. The expedition was a total failure, for in a short time a notice was tacked on the foot of the stairs, stating that all enlisted men were forbidden from occupying any portion of the boat except the lower deck, and if one was found above that deck he would be turned over to the first army post, a prisoner. So we remained on the lower deck and took it out abusing the officers and hoping the boat would blow up, but the scenery was just as nice from the lower deck. End of chapter 24 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 25 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 Our Party of Recruits Own the Earth Let's see. I forget whether I have ever told about getting strung up on a bayonet near New Orleans when I first went south as a recruit. It was before I had joined my regiment, and I was with a gang of recruits, all looking for the regiments we had enlisted in. We had come down from St. Louis on a steamboat, our regiments being scattered all over the department of the Gulf. We were not in any particular hurry to find our regiments, as the longer we kept away from them, the less duty we would have to do. I do not think, out of the whole forty recruits, there was one who was in the least hurry to find his regiment and none of them would have known their regiments if they had seen them, unless somebody told them. They had enlisted just as it happened, all of them hoping the war would be over before they found where they belonged. They didn't know anybody in their respective regiments, hence there were no ties binding them. But they had been together for several months as recruits, until all had got well acquainted, and if they could have been formed into a company for service together, they might have done pretty good fighting. The crowd was becoming smaller, as every day or two some recruit would come and bid us all good-bye. He had actually stumbled onto his regiment, and when the officers of an old regiment, in examining recruits, found one assigned to his regiment, he never took his eyes off the recruit until he was landed. I have seen some very affecting partings, when one of our gang would find where he belonged and had to leave us, perhaps never to meet again. The gang was rapidly dropping apart, and when we got to New Orleans there were only twenty or so left. We reported to the commanding officer, and he quartered us at Carrollton, near the city, in what had once been a beer garden and dance house. We slept on the floor of the dance house, cooked our meals out in the garden, spread our food on the old beer tables, and imagined we were proprietors of the place, or guests of the government. We always ordered beer or expensive wines with our meals. Not that we ever got any beer or wine, because the beer garden was deserted, but we put on a great deal of style. We found a lot of champagne bottles out in the back yard, and I do not think I ever took a meal there without having a champagne bottle sitting beside me on the table, and when any citizens were passing along the street, we would take up the bottles look at the label in a scrutinizing way, as though not exactly certain in our minds whether we were getting as good wine as we were paying for. The old empty bottles gave us a standing in Carrollton society that nothing else could have given us. 
some of the boys got so they could imitate the popping of a champagne cork to perfection by placing one finger in the mouth, prying the cheek around on one side, and letting it fly open suddenly. We would have several of the boys with aprons on, and when anybody was passing on the street, one of us would call, Waiter, open a bottle of that extra dry. The waiter would say, Certainly, sa. Take a bottle between his knees, run his finger in his mouth and make it pop, and then pretend to pour out the champagne in glasses, imitating the fizzing perfectly. It was the extra driest champagne that I ever had. But all that foolishness had the desired effect. It convinced the citizens of Carrollton that we were no ordinary soldiers. We were all nicely dressed, had no guards, and apparently no officers, had plenty of money, which we spent freely at the stores, and the impression soon got out that we were on some special service. And there was, of course, much curiosity to know our business. I learned that we were looked upon as secret service men, and I told the boys about it, and advised them not to tell that we were recruits but to put on an air of mystery, and we would have fun while we remained. One day an oldish gentleman who lived near, and who had a fine orange plantation, or grove, toward which we had cast longing eyes, called at the dance house where we were quartered. We had just finished our frugal meal, and the empty bottles were being taken away. He addressed me and said, Good day, Colonel. I responded as best I could, and invited him to be seated. I apologized for not offering him a glass of champagne, but told him we had cracked the last bottle, and would not have any more until the next day, as I had only that morning requested my friend, the general commanding at New Orleans, to send me a fresh supply, which he would do at once, I had no doubt. Well, you ought to have seen the boys try to keep from laughing, stuffing handkerchiefs in their mouths, etc., but not a man laughed. The old citizen said it was no matter, as he would drop in the next day and drink with us. We talked about the war, and it is my impression he was anxious for us to believe he was a loyal man. But after a while he asked me what particular duty I was on there at Carrollton. I hesitated a moment, and finally told him that I hoped he would excuse me for not telling him, but the fact was it would be as much as my commission would be worth to unfold any of my plans. I told him that time alone would reveal the object of our being there, and until such time as my government thought it best to make it public, it was my duty as an officer to keep silent. He said, certainly, that was all right, and he admired me for keeping my own counsel. I was probably the highest private and rawest recruit in the army. He said there was a natural curiosity on the part of the people of Carrollton to know who we were as we lived so high and seemed such thorough gentlemen. I admitted that we were thorough gentlemen, and thanked him for the high opinion that the cultured people of Carrollton had of us. He wound up by pointing to his orange grove, and said he would consider it a special favor if we would consider ourselves perfectly free to go there and help ourselves at any time, and particularly that evening, as a number of young people would be at his house for a quiet dance. I told him that a few of us would certainly be present, and thanked him kindly. When he was gone, I told the boys, and they wanted to give three cheers. But I got them to keep still, and we talked all the afternoon of the soft snap we had struck, and cleaned up for the party. My intention was to pick out half a dozen of the best-dressed recruits, those that could make a pretty fair showing in society, to go with me. But they all wanted to go, and there was no way to prevent it. So all but one Irishman, that we hired to stay and watch our camp, went. Well, we ate oranges, fresh from the trees, joined in the dance, ate refreshments, and drank the old gentleman's wine, and had a good time, and made a good impression on the ladies, and went back to camp at midnight. On the way over to the party I told the boys the gentleman was coming to see us the next day, and we should have to get a bottle of champagne somewhere to treat him as I have told him we expected some more up from the city. When we came back from the party, a German recruit pulled a bottle of champagne out of his pocket, which he had stolen from the man's house, in order to treat him with the next day. The gentleman came over to our quarters the next day, and we opened our bottle, and he drank to our very good health, though I thought he looked at the label on the bottle pretty close. 
For a week we frequented the gentleman's orange grove every day and ate oranges to our heart's content. Several times during the week we were invited to different houses where we boys became quite interested in the fair girls of Louisiana. It was ten days from the time we settled in the beer garden and we had kept our secret well. Nobody in Carrollton knew that we were raw recruits that had never seen a day of service, but the impression was still stronger than ever that we were pets of the government. We had an old map of the United States that we had borrowed at a saloon, and during the day we would hang the map up and surround it, while I pointed out imaginary places to attack. This we would do while people were passing. Everything was working splendidly, and we decided to give a party. We hired a band to play in the dance house, ordered refreshments, and invited about forty ladies and gentlemen to attend. The day we were to give the party we sent a recruit downtown to draw rations, and he told everybody what a high old time we recruits were having at Carrollton. The commanding officer heard of it, and probably having forgotten that we were up there waiting to be sent to our regiments, he sent a peremptory order for us to report at New Orleans before noon of that day. How could we report at noon when we were going to give a party at night? It was simply impossible, and I, as a sort of breast corporal in charge, sent a man downtown to tell the commanding officer that we had an engagement that night and couldn't come before the next day. I did not know that it was improper to send regrets to a commanding officer when ordered to do anything. The man I sent down to New Orleans came back, and I asked him what the general said. The man said he read the note, and said, The hell they can't come till tomorrow, the impudence of the recruits, they will come tonight. I did not believe we would. In my freshness I did not believe that any commander of troops would deliberately break up a ball and humiliate brave soldiers. I thought my explanation to the commander that we had an engagement would be sufficient, that he would see that it was impossible to hurry matters. We had been to a good deal of expense, and it was our duty, after accepting the hospitalities of those people, to pay our indebtedness in the only way we knew how. And so, as the boys had gathered around me to see what was to be done, I said, On with the dance, let joy be unconfined. Our guests arrived on time, and shortly after it became dark, the Dutch band we had hired from, a beer hall downtown, struck up some sort of foreign music, and there was a sound of revelry by night. We danced half a dozen times, smiled sweetly on our guests, walked around the paths of the old garden, flirted a little, perhaps, and talked big with the male guests, and convinced them anew that we were regular old battle-scarred vets on detached duty of great importance. Near midnight we all sat down to lunch, around the beer tables, and everything was going along smooth. The old gentleman, who had been first to make our acquaintance, and who had been the means of getting us into society, proposed as a toast, our brave and generous hosts, and the boys called upon me to respond. I got up on a bench and was making a speech that, if I had been allowed to continue, would have been handed down in history as one of the ablest of our time. It was conciliatory in tone, calculated to cement a friendship between the army and the citizens of the South, and show that while we were engaged in war there was nothing mean about us, and that we loved our neighbors as ourselves. I was just getting warmed up, and our guests had spatted their hands at some of my remarks, when I heard a tramp, tramp, tramp on the sidewalk outside, and before I could breathe, a squad of infantry soldiers had filed into the garden, surrounded the dance house, a dozen had formed in line before the door, and a sergeant had walked in and ordered the citizens to disperse, and said the recruits were under arrest. Well, I have been in some tight places in my life, but that was the closest place I ever struck. The old gentleman, the leader of our guests, turned to me and asked what this all meant, and I told him to be calm and I would fix everything. I got down off the bench and approached the sergeant to argue the thing. I found that he was a colored man and that his soldiers were also colored troops. This was the unkindest cut of all. I could stand it to be arrested by white soldiers, 
but the sending of a lot of niggers after us white fellows was more than human nature could bear we had most of us been democrats before enlisting and had never looked upon the colored man with that respect that we learned to do later i went up to the sergeant as brave as i could and said look a here boss you have made a dreadful mistake we are gentlemen enjoying ourselves and this interruption on your part will cost you dear now go away with your men quietly and i promise you on the honor of a gentleman that i will not report you and have you punished and i looked at him in a tone of voice that i thought would convince him that i was a friend if he should go away but if he remained it would be at his peril he said he didn't want any foolishness or some of us would get hurt and just then one of the irish recruits who had tried to skin out the back way got jabbed in the pants by a bayonet and he began to howl and cuss the niggers the sergeant called up half a dozen of his sable guard and they surrounded me and some of the boys our guests were becoming frightened ladies had put on their wraps and there was a good deal of confusion when i shouted boys are we going to submit to this insult on the part of a lot of nigger field hands never to the rescue well they didn't to the rescue worth a cent the colored man with a bayonet had every recruit's breast at the point of his weapon three soldiers surrounded me and one run his bayonet through the breast of my coat and out under my arm and held me on my tiptoes and i was powerless except with my mouth the old gentleman our most distinguished guest came up to me and i said to him in confidence so our guests could hear however with a smile this may seem to you a singular proceeding i cannot explain it to you now as i am pledged to secrecy by my government but i will say that the duty we are on here is part of a well-laid plan of our commander and this seeming arrest is a part of the plan this colored sergeant is innocent he is simply obeying orders and is a humble instrument in carrying out our plan i expected to be arrested before morning but hoped it would be after our party however we soldiers have to go where ordered we shall be thrown into prison for a time but when this detective or secret service work on which we are engaged is done we will take pleasure in calling upon you again wearing such laurels as we may win we bid you good night and wish you much happiness they all shook hands with us evidently believing what i had said and even the sergeant seemed to take it in for after the crowd had gone the sergeant said you will excuse me colonel for what i have done i didn't know about any plan all i knew was dat the provost marshal told me to go up to carrollton and pull dem recruits dat was camping at the beer garden and fotch em to the guard house i told him he did perfectly right and then we recruits packed up our things and marched with the colored soldiers to new orleans about six miles and we slept in the guardhouse the next morning the provost marshal called upon us damned us a little for not insisting on being sent to our regiments found out that my regiment was up the river two hundred miles and seemed mad because i passed it when i come from st louis i told him i was not expected to go hunting around for my regiment like a lost calf what i wanted was for my regiment to hunt me up that afternoon he put me on an up-river boat with a tag in my baggage telling where i belonged and i bid good-bye to the recruits after having had three months of fun at the expense of uncle sam End of chapter twenty five recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina chapter twenty six of how private george w peck put down the rebellion by george wilbur peck this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six i strike another soft snap which is harder than any snap heretofore the last two chapters of this stuff has related to early experiences but now that it is probable the chaplain has got over being mad at my trading him the circus horse i will resume the march with the regiment for a month or more i have been waiting for my commission to arrive so that i could serve as an officer but it did not arrive while we were at montgomery and we started away from that city towards vicksburg mississippi with a fair prospect of having hot work with strolling bands of the enemy i was much depressed it had got so they didn't seem to want me anywhere 
it seemed that I was a sort of a Jonah, and wherever I was something went wrong. The chaplain wouldn't have me because he had a suspicion that I was giddy and full of the devil, and I have thought he had an idea I would sacrifice the whole army to perpetrate a practical joke, and he also maintained that I would lie, if a lie would help me out of a scrape. I never knew how such an impression could have been created. The colonel said he would try and get along without me, the adjutant didn't want any more of my mathematics in his reports, and the brigade commander said he would carry the brigade colors himself rather than have me around, as I would bring headquarters into disgrace some way. So I had to serve as a private in my own company, which was very hard on a man who had tasted the sweets of official position. Oh, if my commission did not come soon, I was lost. After we had marched a couple of days, it began to look as though we were liable to have a fight on our hands. Every little while there would be firing in advance or on the flanks, and things looked blue for one who did not want to have any trouble with anybody. One morning when we were cooking our breakfast beside a pitch pine log, a little Irishman, who was a friend of mine, as I always lent him my tobacco, said, there will be a fight today, and some one of the byes will sleep cold tonight. A cold chill came over me, and I wondered which of the byes would draw the ticket of death. The Irishman noticed that I was not feeling perfectly easy, and he said, Sorrel Top, would you just take a bit of advice from the likes of me? I did not like to be called Sorrel Top, but if there was any danger I would take advice from anybody, so I told him to fire away. He told me that when we fell in for the march of the day to arrange to be number four, as in case we were dismounted to fight on foot, number four would remain on his horse and hold three other horses and keep in the rear behind the trees while the dismounted men went into the fight. Great heavens, and that had never occurred to me before. Of course, number four would hold the horses in case of a dismounted fight, and I had never thought what a soft thing it was. It can be surmised by the reader of profane history that when our company formed that morning I was number four. We marched along for a couple of hours when there was some firing on the flanks, and a couple of companies were wheeled into line and marched off into the woods for half a mile, and the order was given to prepare to fight on foot. It was a momentous occasion for me, and when the three men of our four dismounted and handed the bridle reins to me, I was about the happiest man in the army. I did not want the boys to think I was anxious to keep away from the front, so I said, Say, Cap, don't I go too? He said I could if I wanted to, as one of the other boys would hold the horses if I was spoiling to be a corpse. But I told him I guessed, seeing that I was already on the horse, I would stay, and the boys went off laughing, leaving about twenty-five of us number fours holding horses. Now, you may talk all you please about safe places in a fight, but sitting on a horse in plain sight, holding three other prancing, kicking, squalling horses, while the rest of the boys are behind trees or behind logs, popping at the enemy, is no soft thing. The bullet seemed to pass right over our fellows on foot and came right among the horses, who twisted around and got tangled up and made things unpleasant. I was trying to get a stallion I was holding to quit biting my legs when I saw my little Irishman, who had steered me on to the soft snap, dodge down behind his horse's head to escape a bullet that killed one of the horses he was holding. And I said, This is a fine arrangement you have got me into. This is worse than being in front. He said he believed it was as he backed his other horses away from the dying horse, but he said as long as they killed horses we had no cause to complain. There was a sergeant in charge of us, number fours, and he was as cool as any fellow I ever saw. The sergeant was a nice man, but he was no musician. He was an Irishman also, and when any bugle call sounded, he had to ask someone what it was. There was a great deal of uncertainty about bugle calls, I noticed, among officers as well as men. Of course it could not be expected that every man in a cavalry regiment would be a music teacher, and the call sounded so much alike to the uncultivated ear that it was no wonder that everybody got the calls mixed. In camp we got so we could tell assembly and surgeon's call and tattoo and quite a number of others, 
but the calls of battle were Greek to us. The bugle sounded down in the woods, and the sergeant turned to me and asked, "'What the devil is that? I do know.' I was satisfied it was to horse, though when I saw our fellows come rushing back towards the horses, it looked as though the order was to fall back, and I suggested as much to the sergeant. He thought it looked reasonable, too, and he ordered us to fall back slowly toward the regiment. We didn't go so confounded slow, and of course I was ahead with my three horses. The sergeant heard the captain yell to him to hold on, and he got the most of the fours to stop and let the boys get on, but the little Irishmen and myself couldn't hold our extra horses, and they dragged us along over logs and through brush. The regiment drew sabers to shoo the horses back, waved their hats. My horse run his forefeet into a hole, fell down, and let me off over his head. The other horses seemed to walk on me. I became insensible, and the next thing I knew I was in an ambulance behind the regiment, which was on the march, as though nothing had happened. I felt of myself to see if anything was broke, and finding I was all right, I told the driver of the ambulance I guessed I would get out and mount my horse, but he said he guessed I wouldn't, because the colonel had told him if I died to bury me beside the road, but if I lived to bring me to headquarters for punishment. The driver said the boys whose horses I had stampeded wanted to kill me, but the colonel had said death was too good for me. Well, nobody was hurt in the skirmish, and about noon we arrived at a camping place for the night, and the ambulance drove up and I was placed under guard. It seems the sergeant had laid the whole thing to me. He had admitted to the colonel that he didn't know one bugle call from another, and he supposed I did, and when he asked me what it was, and I said it was to retreat, he supposed I knew, and retreated. The colonel asked me what I had to say, and I told him I didn't know any bugle call except get your quinine, get your quinine, that when I enlisted there was nothing said about my ability to read notes in music, and I never had learned and couldn't learn, as I had no more ear for music than a mule. I told him if he would furnish a music teacher I would study hard to try and master the difference between forward and back but that it didn't seem to me as though I ought to be held responsible for an expression of opinion, however erroneous, when asked for it by a superior officer. I told him that when the bugle sounded and I saw the boys coming back on a hop, skip, and jump, it seemed to me the most natural thing in the world that the bugle had sounded a retreat. That seemed the only direction we could go, and as my natural inclination was to save those horses that he had placed in my charge, of course I interpreted the bugle call to mean for us to get out of there honorably, and as the only way to get out honorably was to get out quick, we got up and dusted. The colonel always gave me credit for being a good debater, and he smiled and said that as no damage had been done he would not insist that I be shot on the spot, but he felt that an example should be made of me. He said I would be under arrest until bedtime down under a tree, half a mile or so from headquarters, in plain sight, and he would send music teachers there to teach me the bugle calls. I thanked him, in a few well-chosen remarks, and the guard marched me to the tree which was the guardhouse. I found another soldier there, under arrest, who had rode out of the ranks to water his horse while on the march, against orders, and a Confederate prisoner that had been captured in the morning skirmish, a captain of a Virginia regiment. The captain seemed real hurt at having been captured, and was inclined to be uppish and distant. I tried two or three times to get him into conversation on some subject connected with the war, but he wouldn't have it. He evidently looked upon me as a horse thief, a deserter, and a bad man, or else a soldier who had been sent to pump information out of him. I never was let alone quite as severely as I was by our prisoner at first. But I went to work and built a fire, and soon had some coffee boiling, bacon frying, and sweet potatoes roasting. And when I spread the lay out on the ground and said, Colonel, this is on me, won't you join me? I think he was the most surprised man I ever saw. He had watched every move I made in cooking with a yearning such as is seldom seen, and he probably had no more idea that he was going to have a mouthful of it than that he should fly. 
His eyes might have been weak, but if he had been a man I knew well, I should have said that there were a couple of tears gathering in his eyes, and I was quite sure of it when the flood broke over the eyelid dam and rolled down among the underbrush whiskers. He stopped the flood at once by an effort of will, though there seemed a something in his throat when he said, You don't mean it, do you, Colonel? I told him, of course, I meant it, and to slide right up and help himself, and I speared a great big sweet potato and some bacon and placed them on a big leaf and poured coffee out in the only cup I had. He kicked on using the cup, but I said we would both drink out of it. He said, You are very kind, sir, and that was all he said during the meal. But how he did eat! He tried to act as though he didn't care much for dinner, and as though he was eating out of courtesy to me, but I could tell by the way the sweet potato went down in the depths of my confederate friend, and by the joyous look when a swallow of coffee hit the right place, that he was having a picnic. When we were through with dinner, and the guard and the other prisoner were cooking theirs, he said, My friend, I do not mind telling you now that I was much in need of food. I had not eaten since yesterday morning, as we have been riding hard to intercept you, gentlemen, sir. I trust I shall live long enough to repay you, sir. I told him not to mention it, as all our boys made it a point to divide when we captured a prisoner. He said he believed his people felt the same way, but God knew they had little to divide. He said he trembled when he thought that some of our men who were prisoners in the South were faring very poorly, but it could not be helped. Suppose I had captured you, he said with a smile that was forced. I could not have given you a mouthful of bread until we had found a southern family that had bread to spare. I told him it was pretty tough, but it would all be over before long, and then we would all have plenty to eat. I got out a pack of cards, and the Confederate captain played seven up with me while we smoked. Presently nine buglers came down to where we were, formed in line, and began to sound cavalry calls in concert. I knew that they were the music teachers the colonel had sent to teach me the calls. The Confederate looked on in astonishment while they sounded a call, and when it was done I asked the chief bugler what it was, and he told me, and I asked him to sound something else, which he did. My idea was to convince the prisoner that this was a part of daily routine. He got nervous and couldn't remember which was Trump's, and finally said we might talk all we pleased about the horrors of Andersonville, but to be blowed to death with cavalry bugles was a fate that only the most hardened criminals should suffer. The Confederate evidently had no ear for music more than I had, and he soon got enough. However, the buglers kept up their noise till about supper time, when they were called on. I got another meal for the Confederate, and he seemed to be actually getting fat. The colonel of my regiment came down to where we were and said, you fellows seem to be doing pretty well. And then he had a long talk with the rebel prisoner, invited him up to his tent to pass the night, apologized for the concert he had been giving us, explained what it was for, told me I could go to my company if I thought I could remember a bugle call in the future. The captain shook hands with me and thanked me cordially, and we separated. He was exchanged the next day, and I never saw him for twenty-two years when I found him at the head of a manufacturing enterprise in his loved Virginia, and he furnished me a more expensive meal than I did him years before, but it didn't taste half as good as the bacon dinner in Alabama under the guardhouse tree. End of chapter 26 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 27 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27 A Short Story About a Pair of Boots. When I enlisted in the cavalry, I bought a pair of top boots of the Wellington pattern, stitched with silk up and down the legs, which were of shiny Morocco. They came clear above my knees, and from the pictures I had seen of cavalry soldiers, it struck me those boots would be a passport to any society in the army. The first few months of my service, it seemed to me, the boots gave me more tone than any one thing. I learned afterwards that all new recruits came to the regiment with such boots, 
and that they were the laughing stock of all the old veterans. I did not know that I was being guyed by the boys, and I loved those boots above all things I had. To be sure, when we struck an unusually muddy country, some idiot of an officer seemed to be inspired to order us to dismount. The boys who had common army boots would dismount anywhere, in mud or water, but it seemed to me cruel for officers to order a dismount when they knew I would have to step in the mud halfway up to my knees with those Morocco boots on. Several times when ordered to dismount in the mud, I have ridden out of the road where it was not muddy to dismount, but the boys would laugh so loud and the officers would swear so wickedly that I got so I would dismount wherever they told me, suppress my emotions as I felt my beautiful shiny boots sink into the red clay, and when we got into camp I would spend half the night cleaning my boots. The captain said if I would spend half the time cleaning my carbine and saber that I did cleaning my boots, I would have been a model soldier. I think that for the first year of my service I had as elegant a pair of boots as could be found in the army, but it was the hardest work to keep track of them. The first three months it was all I could do to keep the chaplain from trading me a pair of old army shoes for my boots. The arguments he used to convince me that Morocco boots were far above my station and that they were intended for a chaplain were labored. If he had used the same number of words in the right direction, he could have converted the whole army. I had to sleep with my boots under my head every night to prevent them from being stolen, and twice they were stolen from my tent, but in each case recovered at the sutler's, where they had been pawned for a bottle of brandy peaches which I had to pay for to redeem the boots. The boots had become almost a burden to me in keeping them, but I enjoyed them so much that money could not have bought them. When we were in a town for a few days and I rode around, it did not make any difference whether I had any other clothes on, of any account. The Morocco boots captured the town. The natives could not see how a man who wore such boots could be anything but a high-up thoroughbred. The last time I lost my boots will always be remembered by those who were in the same command. We were on the march with a Michigan and a New Jersey regiment through the dustiest country that ever was. The dust was eight inches deep in the road, and just like fine ashes. Every time a horse put his foot down the dust would raise up above the trees, and as there were two thousand horses with four feet apiece, and each foot in constant motion, it can be imagined that the troops were dusty. And it was so hot that the perspiration oozed out of us, but the dust covered it. The three regiments took turns in acting as rear guard to pick up stragglers, and on this hot and dusty day the New Jersey regiment was in the rear. It was composed of Germans entirely, with a German colonel, a man who had seen service in Europe, and he looked upon a soldier as a machine with no soul, fit only to obey orders. That was not the kind of a soldier I was. During the day's march the boys stripped off everything they could. I know all I had on was a shirt and pants and a handkerchief around my head. I took off my boots and coat and let the colored cook of the company strap them onto his saddle with the camp kettles. He usually rode right behind the company, and I thought I could get my things any time if I wanted to dress up. It was the hardest day's march that I had ever experienced, lungs full of dust and every man so covered with dust that you could not recognize your nearest neighbor. Afternoon the command halted beside a stream, and it was announced that we would go into camp for the night. The colored cook came along soon after, and he was perfectly pale, whether from dust or fright I could not tell, but he announced to me, in a manner that showed that he appreciated the calamity which had befallen the command, that he had lost my boots. I was going to kill him, but my carbine was full of dust, and I made it a point never to kill a man with a dirty gun. So I let him explain. He said, I fell back to de rear by that plantation where the cotton gin was burning to see if I couldn't get a canteen of buttermilk to wash the dust out in my throat. When dat Dutch New Jersey gang come along, and the boss he said, Dicker, you got back ahead for you belong, or I gick you in the pack met a saber, ain't it? And when I get on my mule to come along, he grabbed the boots and he say, Nicker, 
dat boots is better for me and when i was going to take dem away from him he sticked me in de pants wid a saber den i come away i could have stood up under having an arm shot off but to lose my boots was more than i could bear it never did take me long to decide on any important matter and in a moment i decided to invade the camp of that new jersey regiment recapture my boots or annihilate every last foreigner on our soil so i started off barefooted without a coat and covered with dust for the headquarters of the new jersey fellows they had been in camp but a few minutes but every last one of them had taken a bath in the river brushed the dust off his clothes and looked ready for dress parade that was one fault of those foreigners they were always clean if they had half a chance i went right to the colonel's tent and he was surrounded with officers and they were opening bottles of beer and how cool it looked there was something peculiar about those foreigners no matter if they were doing duty in the most inaccessible place in the south and were short of transportation you could always find beer at their headquarters i walked right in and the colonel was just blowing the foam off a glass of beer he looked at me in astonishment and i said in a voice husky from dust down my neck colonel this is an important epoch in the history of our beloved country events have transpired within the past hour which leaves it an open question whether as a nation we are afoot or on horseback great heavens said the colonel stopping with his glass of beer half drank you frighten me what has happened but wait when take a glass of beer as you seem exhausted and broke up captain uskapil hand the shentlemen some beer my god but you look hard stranger i do not believe that i ever drank anything that seemed to go right to the spot the way that beer did it seemed to start a freshet of dust down my neck clear my throat and brace me up while i was drinking it i noticed that the german colonel and his officers eyed me closely my bare feet my flannel shirt full of dust and my hair that looked as though i had stood on my head in the road they waited for me to continue and after draining the last drop in the glass i said colonel it was no ordinary circumstance that induced you brave foreigners holding allegiance to european sovereigns to fly to arms to defend this new nation from an internecine foe while we natives and to the manner born left our ploughs in the furrow to spring to arms you left your shoemaker shops the spigots of your beer saloons the marts of commerce in which you were engaged and stood shoulder to shoulder where the bullets of the enemy whistled there could be found the brave dutchman of new jersey it brings tears to eyes unused to weeping to think of the german fathers and mothers of our land who are waiting and watching for the return of sons who will never come back and this is indeed harder for them to bear when we reflect that these boys were not obliged to fight for our country holding allegiance as i said before to wait a minute if you please said the colonel take one more drink and tell me if you please what the hell you was trying to get at captain heimrich give the shentleman a glass of beer a second glass of beer was given me and i drank it there was evidently a suspicion on the part of the new jersey officers that the importance of my visit had been overrated by them and they seemed anxious to have me come to the point on the march to-day said i wiping the foam off my moustache on my shirt-sleeve one of your thieving soldiers stole my boots from our nigger cook who was conveying them for me a cavalry soldier without boots is no good i came after my boots and i will have them or blood return my boots or by the eternal the wisconsin cavalry regiment will come over here and everlastingly gallop over your fellows the constitution of the united states and the declaration of independence are on my side in civil life a man's house is his castle in the army a man's boots is his castle give me my boots sir or the blood of the slain will rest on your heads the colonel was half mad and half pleased he tapped his forehead with his forefinger and looked at his officers in a manner that showed he believed my head was wrong but he said kindly my man you go out and sit under a tree in the shade and i will have your boots found if they are in my regiment and i went out i heard the colonel say to one of his officers 
it was too bad dat two good glasses of beer should be spoiled giving them to dat crazy soldier thee must be more careful mit the beer pretty soon an officer came out and asked me how the boots were taken and they gave him all the information i had and he sent men all around the regiment and in an hour or so the boots were brought to me the man who stole them was arrested the officers apologized to me and i went back to my regiment in triumph with my boots under my arms the incident got noised about among the other regiments and for months after that when the colonel of the new jersey cavalry rode by another regiment the boys would yell out boots boots or when a company or squad of the new jersey fellows would pass along it was look out for your boots the shoemakers are coming for stealing that one pair of boots by one man a whole regiment got a reputation for stealing that hung to it for a long time ten years afterward i was connected with a new york daily paper and one evening i was detailed to go to a new jersey city to report the commencement exercises of a college in the program of exercises i noticed that a man of the same name of that of the new jersey colonel was one of the college professors and i wondered if he was the same man during the evening he put in an appearance on the stage and i could see that he was the colonel who had given me the beer and caused my boots to be returned to me after the exercises of the evening the new york newspaper men were invited to partake of a collation in the apartments of the college officials and the professors were introduced to the newspaper men when my turn came to be introduced and the old colonel stood before me i said general you were in the army were you not yes sir said the old man i am proud to say that i fought for my adopted country but why do you ask we have met before i too was a soldier i was at your headquarters once on a very important mission i was entertained sir in your tent permitted to partake of the good things you had and sent away happy well you don't say so said the old man as he pressed my hand warmly fair was dis dat you were my guest and vat was the important message and he smiled all over his face at the prospect of hearing something about old times it was in mississippi between montgomery alabama and vicksburg do you remember the hottest and dustiest day that ever was when we camped on a little stream said i oh yeah said the colonel very well it was an awful time i went to your headquarters with information of vital importance one of your soldiers had stolen my boots got him himmel said the old colonel now a college professor as he looked at me to see if there was any resemblance between the new york reporter and the dusty barefoot soldier of ten years before phil i never heard the last of them damn boots and you are the same veller eh i have often thought since that day what an awful gall you had but it is all over now you vat your boots vile you are in new jersey for plenty of those cavalry men are all around here but do me a favor now and don't ever again say boots to me that's a good fellow and then we all sat down to lunch and the old colonel told the newspaper boys from new york about how i called at his tent on the march looking for a pair of boots that had eloped with one of his new jersey dutchmen end of chapter twenty seven end of how private george w peck put down the rebellion recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina